Thank you. Um, any questions for any of the panellists here? Yes, over there. Oh, very good, and a good catch. <laughs> right, off we go. Could there theoretically be any medicine that would work on humans but not animals? And how would we find out about it? So are there any, if I, if I didn't quite hear you, medicines that work on humans but not animals? Yeah. Oh, was that? Was that's that for you, that's 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 for you that's Deborah. That's it's you. <laughs> do, you want me to, do you want me to repeat it? So, yes, please. Are there, are, do, do you know of any medicines that work on hu humans but don't work on animals? And how did you find that out? So, oh. the reverse of a normal question. That's a good one. So, in the, 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 the sphere that we're in, infection is quite interesting because things tend to work in humans and animals and a lot of fungi and bacteria will behave in, in kind of similar ways. But it's, it's a very good point if you're trying to develop a cancer medicine because animal disease models um, aren't always representative of what's going on in the human body. So another bizarre thing about um, it being difficult to get financial support to develop anti-infectives is the failure rate is actually very low because the data that you get in the lab, even in animals, is very predictive of what's going to happen in a human um, because really we're all furry test tubes and fungi and bacteria tend to behave the same in most organisms. Cancers and some other diseases are, are much more complex. And if you think about it, our drugs aren't targeting the body. They're actually targeting the bug. So that's pretty common um, to whatever model system or organism that that, that bug is, is, is in. It's very different if you've got something that has to have the same pharmacology in the same cell in, in an animal versus versus a human. So it is an advantage in the, the, the field that we're working in that the, the medicines, once they work in the lab and they work in a first model system, they do tend to work in everything. So the, the failure rate is lower and the, the tests that we can perform are much more predictive of, of success in, in people and in the clinic. Thank you. Any yes, over here now. Gosh, we're. Thank you. Um, where do you get all the animals from? And are they bred in captivity or are they from the wild? Animal testing. Yeah, it's, Deborah. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, and. and I am a huge animal lover, eight horses, four cats, um, and lots of rodents, but not on purpose. So we <laughs> do not do any animal testing ourselves. Um, we're not licensed to, and, and we wouldn't want to anyway. It's very, very, very highly controlled, as you'd imagine. So there are specialist companies that, that do it for us, um, some in the UK, some elsewhere. Um, and there are different types, as I mentioned, of animals that, that you do have to use. Yes, they do have to be bred in captivity because they have to be kept in a, as you can imagine, quite a sterile environment. Um, it's, it's a fabulous environment. I have never done any animal studies where I haven't actually been to see the animals because um, I'm a great believer if, you know, it has to be done, unfortunately, until we come up with, with a better way. Um, but you absolutely need to see and, and speak with the people who are going to conduct the experiments for you um, so that the conditions are fantastic um, and the lives that the animals have, they will never be in pain, they will never be in discomfort. The lives that they have are amazing while they do have them. But yeah, unfortunately, they're, they're bred in captivity. They have to be kept in captivity, but the environment that they live in um, is, is the best it can possibly be. And I, I think for anyone who has to do this, you absolutely have to go to these facilities and speak with the team who are going to do the work for you and literally look, look those animals in the eye. Um, 
and a lot of them are very cute so you, you do have to have a very strong stomach especially if you, you do love animals like like i do um the nice thing is as well this is something that not a lot of people know about the facilities that that do these tests that some of the animals now can actually be rehomed um, and there are waiting lists because people know about it. So some of the animals that might have been in control groups or were an excess and, and backup animals, obviously not the animals that were involved in any experiments, but they, they can be rehomed. So there are big programs doing that now, which probably didn't exist even five years ago. So it, it's as positive as it possibly can be. I've worked in different countries and it's obviously quite a, you know, th this is a big issue. Um, the UK, I am very proud to say in terms of standards and also moves for the three R's. So, you know, reduction in the number of animals, refinement of the experiments that you do to make them much more efficient and again to use less animals and replacement so wherever you don't need to use an animal you will not use it the uk is absolutely leading the world in that um and yeah but obviously i told you about the other countries that i, I lived in but we you know very different playing field and the uk's um standards ethics policy on animal use are as good as they can possibly be thank you any other questions for any of the people up here? Yes. Come on then. How many degrees did you do for to be where you are and then what unis did you go to as well? So how, what degrees did you do, Deborah, and what university did you go to? So my first degree after my physics, chemistry, biology A level was biochemistry. And I was a bit strange because I did it at the University of Buckingham. And at the time, that was a two year. Um, so with hardly any holidays, I wouldn't recommend it, but it was a two year degree course. Um, and then I did my PhD in immunology at University College London. And then I moved to California and studied at, well, did my first postdoctoral post at the University of California, San Diego. And then I did a year at the University of Ghent in Belgium. And then came to the Rowett in Aberdeen, the Rowett Research Institute, and spanned the business out of there in 2004. But yeah, I think biochemistry was a great first degree because it, it's it's and you now can do biomedical science degrees. I think if you're not quite sure, um, doing a, a, a broader based biomedical science, biological science degree is a great way to probably find out where your passion really is and, and the thing that really interests you and you want to commit the rest of your, even your educational career to. Um, and then immunology, which is, is pretty specialized. I think back then was even taught as a first degree but I, I fell naturally into that and, and did four years doing my PhD um, in London and I absolutely loved it. And, and the difference from, even though we did lots of practical stuff in my first degree, um, obviously lots of lectures, more a, a taught structure, a PhD, it's your own project. Um, you're very much hands-on at the bench. Um, that was very different, but I, I love that much more than any kind of theoretical stuff. And obviously the combination of both is, is required, but yeah, PhD was, was brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Ruth, which universities did you attend? So I, I went to the University of Bristol, which was 45 miles um, roughly from where I lived, and no one understood a word I said for the first week. I had a slightly stronger Welsh accent and I spoke very fast. I did a three-year degree in BSc Maths with Stats. I stayed to do a PhD in Bristol, three years, then I went to Cambridge, up to St Andrews and then down to Edinburgh a couple of years ago. And Leslie was on my interview panel at I the was. University of Edinburgh. <laughs> what a good decision I made. Um, any other questions? I have to say that um, travel, doing, a, um, doing science, is what you do. 
so you get to travel everywhere and anywhere. But if you don't want to travel, that's also okay as well. So for part of my life, I traveled all over the place, um, and then part of my life, I just stayed in Edinburgh. So it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity, and you get to meet lots of fantastic people. I think we, you've all talked about the places, but I think what we've never mentioned is all the wonderful people you meet along the way as well. And that's a true privilege, yeah. both as your students, but also other researchers as well, as we're very fortunate to, to be able to do that. Good, good. Any other questions? For anybody? No, well, okay, then uh, it just simply remains for me to uh, finish off today. First of all, by thanking, and please join me in thanking all the speakers that you've had today. Please also join me in thanking the staff from the Royal Society of Edinburgh for set, uh, setting this, thing, this day up. I'd like to thank Wallace High School for hosting this event. Thank you very much. And let me finish by asking you, having heard from our scientists today, have any of you changed your mind and want to now become, want to look further at doing science more? Yay! Well done, team. And if any of you, I better ask the negative question, have any of you decided this is absolutely not what you want to be doing? <laughs> okay. Actually, if it helps you decide, then it's worth it whether you decide yes or no. But thank you all very much and safe home. Thank you.